also going to be getting into the types of marketing. It's interesting to me that in this day and age when people talk about marketing and digital marketing, everybody kind of automatically thinks Instagram when there are many ways to market your there are many reasons, you know, there are many ways to market your business online. So marketing, um, online digital marketing is more than an Instagram post, right? There's more to it than that. Um, and I wanna talk about that today. I also wanna talk about some common misconceptions about marketing to a niche. So what are some things that, um, yeah, misconceptions that people might have about that and why a lot of people avoid it, why it's so counterintuitive to so many people, and then also best practices about how to market within the different um, methods, right, that I'm going to be sharing today. So best practices for each method that you should put in place, because the way you market on one platform or in one area or with one desired outcome is going to be different than if you market in another, all right? So I'm really excited about this. This is, this is like some foundational information, not just like random tips and tricks that are only valuable this year, but this is more foundational stuff that you can use for forever in the lifespan of your business. So, all right, a little bit about me. Um, so we have a picture of me on the on the right, um, but I am a computer engineer by education, right? Random that I went from computer engineering into wedding and event planning, but I did. Um, I also got certified as a project manager. Um, right after graduating college, I went into IT consulting and later got into IT project management um, and that, so I'm very much so a nerd. I definitely understand um, a lot of things in corporate America. And honestly, the, I spent many years in corporate America while also growing my business. And I learned a lot from that, right? I learned a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm actually grateful for it. Although a lot of people are running away from their corporate jobs. I think that while you're there, there's a lot that you can learn. And so I always like to start with that. Um, I'm also a public speaker and a business coach. So I'm speaking here tonight. I've spoken in many other places. Um, I was invited back uh, to University of Pennsylvania where I graduated to speak um, to the graduating class and of uh, um, you know the engineering school um, during their career day. Um, I've spoken at a lot of conferences and I love to do it. So this is, this is my jam. I enjoy speaking and sharing. Um, I'm also in ministry in my church in many different ways, uh, but the ministries that I lead are the marketing ministry coincidentally, um, and also our singles ministry. I'm also a member of the choir. I've been in the choir forever um, as well. So these are things that I do. I, I, I'm all about my money and business, but I also am all about building a life of balance. So I have time to do other things. I am Nigerian uh, and I grew up in New Jersey, New York. It's complicated. I was born in one, raised in the other, but I just say both. Um, and then I love nature. Like I love going to the beach. I love camping. I love going on long walks. I love jogging. I love doing all the things that take place during wedding season, which again is why building a life of balance is always crucial for me, right? And I always teach the kind of things that help you to build balance. Um, so because, yeah, I've, I've had to do that. Um, and outside of work, I love to have girls night going on a girls trip. I went out last night with one of my girlfriends the waterfront the night before I went out with someone else like I like to make time to just enjoy and just do things right like I'm not I'm not that person who's always in front of a computer right like I, I make time to do other things and I think everyone should you know life more abundantly that's like one of my favorite quotes um Jesus came to give me life more abundantly and I'm gonna take it so making a move to DC the reason this was so critical for me um I've been in business for 10 years, but I have not lived in the DC metro area for 10 years. I moved here about eight and a half years ago. So right when my business was like ramping up and doing well in New York, I decided for personal reasons I wanted to leave. And I knew a little bit about marketing to a niche. So I'm gonna give myself a little bit of credit. And I was like, you know what? I know who my specialty is. I'm gonna focus on Nigerian weddings. And um, yeah, I was like, I'm gonna focus on Nigerian weddings and I'm gonna focus on, you know, this is gonna be my plan, whatever. And so when I get, to DC, I'll just tell people that's my specialty and I'll get clients, it'll be easy, you know? Um, that wasn't quite what happened. So I got here and I realized that it, the Nigerian and African market was already saturated, right? Every time I spoke to someone and said, hey, oh yeah, I do wedding planning and I specialize in Nigerian and African weddings, they'd be like, oh yeah, I know like four other wedding planners who do that, you should meet them. Which meant that I was a new kid on the block. I wasn't the one that people trusted or knew or, you know, all of that. I was basically going back to square one. Like, how do I get my name out there to people who don't already like default to one of these other four people, right? I also chose to join a church where like three of them attend, right? So church wasn't really gonna be my marketing method, right? Going around handing out my business cards. Cause I just, I just, yeah, it just wasn't my thing. So I had to figure out what I was gonna do, right? Planning weddings in New York, New Jersey wasn't 
horrible at first, but after a while, I was going to New York and New Jersey every week, going on a site visit, seeing a client, going to a bridal shower, picking linen, like, and I was just like, I didn't move to DC to be in New York every weekend, right? So I was like, I, I, something's gotta change and I have to figure out how to make my voice hurt. So two things, either I'm gonna quit, I'm just gonna forget all about wedding planning, I'm just gonna focus on my little IT job and let's let that be that and just say, you know, I had a, I had a good long run, it was great, but now I'm just gonna focus on IT because I'm not trying to do this drive all the time or I had to find a way to make it work. Those are my only two choices. And I feel like a lot of people in the room in the virtual room tonight are probably in that place where it's like, I gotta find a way to make this work, get the clients, find a way to get people to buy from me or I'm just gonna give up and just do something else. And I'm actually really glad that I chose to learn as much as I could, dig in, try a lot of different methods and figure out what works. And a lot of the strategies are things that I still use today. And that's what I'm gonna be sharing. So I always like to start with my story just so you understand where I'm coming from. I don't like to come from a, oh yeah, do this, post three times a day and blah, 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 without you understanding where I'm coming from um, and, and understanding that I understand what it's like to like be trying to fight out of a hump. Um, Cause I've been there twice <laughs> um, and it's very possible. You know, I basically went from this to being like the side after speaker about Nigerian and West African events, which to me was so interesting, like going from being like the Nigerian and African wedding planner that nobody knew to being the one that got invited to all the wedding conferences to speak about Nigerian and West African events. And that came from the way that I showed up online, the way that I continue to push and the way that I was consistent and all of that. Um, so that's why I like to speak about this so you understand where I'm coming from <laughs> and just what the transformation was so, you, so that you know um, basically how this works, right? And that it could work for you. So getting into the meat of it, there's two ways that people shop, right? There's two ways that people find brands, find service providers. Most of you are service providers. I don't remember if anyone was selling products on the line, uh, but how do people find you? One, they are actively searching for you. So one of the things that people ignore a lot, but there are people out there who are actively searching for you. And there are people out there who are just chilling around, you know, whatever happens to hit their TV screen, whatever happens to hit their phone, whatever, they just passively wait for it, right, to, to hit it. So those are two forms, two ways that people shop. I feel like people focus only on the passive, but we're going to talk about the active again as well today, right? Now, people who are actively searching, right, and this is like my favorite way to market, focus on the people who are actively searching for what it is that you do, um, is placing your business and your content in places that those who are literally looking for you can find you, right? Um, there's so many people who post so much online, but they're not findable by people who are searching for them. Uh, and so you have to make sure that you are searchable, right? So the number one thing is search engine optimization. That's what SEO stands for. If you've ever heard of SEO, that's what it stands for. And that's optimizing your website to be found on Google, on Bing, and on Yahoo. This is something, this is a service I even provide, um, you know, just a VIP day to just set up your site, right? Do everything you need to do to be findable on Google. And not just findable, not just indexed. Anybody could be indexed on Google, which a lot of people ignore, but for the right things, right? And I'm going to give you a hint. Nobody's Googling your business name. So if you've, if you've optimized your website to be searchable for your business name, no one will find you because I don't want to hurt your feelings. I say this to all my clients, my coaching clients, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but nobody's searching for your business name. They're searching for a solution, right? So search engine optimization is so key. Um, the second thing is Pinterest. Pinterest, for the most part, is actually a search. It's more of a search engine than it is a uh, um, it's more of a search engine than it is a social media site, right? So that is a place to put your content in front of people who are actually looking for what you do, right? Um, how many times do you guys go on Pinterest and you search, oh, you know, lavender bedroom, you know? I spent a lot of time on Pinterest when I bought my home and I was, paint, you know, looking for new paint because I bought a foreclosed home and their paint choices were not the best, the people who used to live here. So I, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it at that. They were kind of weird, but anyways, I, repainted everything and I was like hmm what do I want do I want a soft glue do I want this like and I started looking at stuff and I went on Pinterest right to look for that so that is what people do there another place that's a great search engine is YouTube I actually just got off the phone with a potential client who found me on YouTube um I have two YouTube pages one is geared towards brides one geared towards entrepreneurs the one geared towards brides she found us on there and she was like oh this is great content you know people go on YouTube looking for things social media hashtags right this is where hashtags come into play using hashtags that people who would actually want to buy from you would be searching so that you come up in those places it's so amazing there was a period that this year I, I i this year i really like doubled down on focusing on my my coaching business so that i did spend a couple of weeks where i just didn't post on social media at all on my business on the 
wedding planning side. And I was just really focused on coaching and some other things. And I still continue to get inquiries from Instagram. And I was just like, where did she even come from? You know, but it made sense because for years I'd use hashtags in a way that even though I'm not married to my, um, to my Instagram page, people can still find me. And this is where it comes back to being focused on creating content that lives forever, right? And which means focusing on making sure your content is findable by the people who are looking for you, right? Um, now, another way that people actively search for things, these last three um, may not be as popular, but going to expos, you know, anybody who goes to an expo is actively looking to buy something, right? If it's a hair expo, they're actively walking around and looking at hair products, you know, things like that magazines sometimes people may look at the ads and pick things out i mean that is you know becoming less and less now that the world's becoming digital but it's another place and then of course google places so google places is when you search for something online and you see those little things we see the stars and you see location and all that before even having to go to a website that's a google places listing so all focusing on these sorts of things are the things that get you that put you in front of people who are actively looking for what you sell which is my favorite place to be in front of people who are actively looking for what I'm trying to sell. I'm not trying to force my content down the throat of someone who's been married for five years and doesn't care to have a wedding planner, right? I'm trying to be in front of people who are actively looking for what I'm selling, right? So this is like a major mindset shift that I think a lot of people don't talk about, but it's really important, especially to having a steady stream of clients and also for you to not have to be married to like actively like, you know, not having to be married to your phone basically. Um, and I think this is something that has worked for me. Now, the other, we haven't even gotten into tips yet, but I'm just getting into types of marketing. Now, the other type of marketing is passive shopping, which is probably what, what I would say most people focus more on. Sorry, so passive shopping is where you, and, and to, to be successful here, you flood your content, right? Flooding is important. Consistency is important in places that people just hang out, right? And where people just look for stuff to look at um, because people are just there passively and, and that's how you can gain brand awareness by just flooding your content in the places that people just hang out, right? An example of that would be a television ad. You're just passively watching This Is Us, minding your own business and just trying to see what happens next. I'm behind on the current season of This Is Us, but you're just, you know, watching TV, just trying to see what happened. Oh, it's another flashback with Jack and you're like, oh my gosh, this is great. And then commercial comes up and it's a toothpaste commercial. That's passive because you were, you sat down to watch This Is Us, but then an ad came up for Pronamel and you're like, you know what? I do want something for sensitive teeth. I feel like my teeth are kind of sensitive. Let me let me buy Pronamel next time I go to Target. That is pa that is passive marketing, right? Because you weren't really actively looking for a new toothpaste, but you an ad came up and it caught your attention and it makes you realize that you want this thing, right? So places that you people market want to passive shoppers would be Instagram, obviously would be a top choice these days. It's kind of trumped Facebook, I guess. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, television ads, web ads, billboard and banner apps and distributing flyers. Now I'd say the top three is probably more of what I like to focus on. The rest are quite expensive um, without necessarily always being as effective depending on the type of, uh, product you're marketing, right? If it's not something that's already available and like Target or something, it, it, it just may not work as well. But Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, is, I mean, it's right at your fingertips and you can control it. So, but it's always very important to know that for the most part, you are focusing on passive shoppers here. And that's like your primary thing. And then the secondary thing is, like I said earlier with hashtags, making sure you're findable. Um, in the future, right? If someone searches for a certain hashtag that you come up, right? So these are this is, you know, those are the two different ways that people shop, right? They actively look for stuff, they passively look for stuff. My favorite example is if I happen to go to Miami and I'm like, you know what? I'm on vacation. I want a new hairdo. I want box braids real quick, right? What I'm going to do is go on Google and search for hair braider in Miami. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to look for, I'm probably not even going to search for hair salon. I'm probably going to search for hair braider. Right. And so that is how I am looking for people who specifically have what I'm looking for in that moment. And when you think like that, I think that for me, a lot of things that I learned about marketing came from observing my own buying habits. I, there was a period of time when I really wanted to learn about marketing, especially after I moved to Maryland, like I mentioned, I spent a lot of time buying fitness apparel, fitness workout programs, 
hair, natural hair stuff, and just all kinds of stuff online on. And every time I would end up on somebody's checkout page, I'd be like, how did I end up here? Like I had to, like, I like, I was like re, re reverse engineering my own brain to figure out how I got there and what it is that happened that made me interested in buying. Right. And that's how I came up with a lot of these things that I still use today. It was really just observing my own buying habits literally over months or even a couple of years. Um, you may not want to wait months and years though to implement. So, which is why we're, we're teaching this today, but, um, you know, it is really important, right? Like the, this, putting yourself out there in this way. So um, before we get into too many methods, okay, we're going to pause, we're going to pull back and try about something very important, which a lot of people don't even address and think about. And this is why so much marketing falls 100% flat um, and doesn't convert. The number one question you have to ask yourself is, who are you selling to? Who are you selling to? Women is not enough. Men and women is definitely not enough. That's way too broad, right? Honestly, honestly, even black women may not be enough. Like you gotta get specific, right? Because marketing to everyone is marketing to no one. That's like a golden, like it's like a golden, I, I didn't come up with that quote. Someone else said it's like a golden rule in marketing. If you try to market to everyone under the sun, you're technically marketing to no one. You need to be specific. Luxury is not specific. The best is not specific. So me walking around saying I'm the best wedding planner, you know, that's subjective. I don't, I don't go around saying it's very subjective. That's not, you know, it throwing out words like official and luxury and premiere and all these things is not specific, right? Because at the end of the day, no one's even searching for those things. What they're searching for is a, the answer to a specific problem. And luxury is not specific. I, it's one of my favorite quotes. That, that one I came up with, luxury is not specific. So a niche, what is a niche? Um, this whole thing is titled marketing to a niche. And I'm sure there's probably a couple of people who are like, well, what's a niche though? So a niche is denoting or relating to products, services, or interests that appeal to a small specialized section of the population. Small specialized section of the population, right? So you have to focus on one section of the population. Like an example I would say is that I buy a lot of my clothes from Shop FKSP, right? Which is a brand that was created by Style Print Entry. She was a style blogger for many years and then started this apparel brand like five or six years ago. The reason I buy a lot of stuff from her is because I'm tall and slender and she makes clothes for people who are tall and slender, right? A lot of times it's hard to find you know, different body types, is, it's hard to find different clothes for different reasons, right? For some reason, I don't know, it's just, it can just be hard. But I know that anything I buy from her, even if it's a small, it's still gonna be long enough for me. And that's something that, that's the reason I, I buy from her. And frankly, her stuff is not cheap, but I pay premium for it because I can trust it and I know it's gonna come well, right? And that's the value of a niche. So what are the people that you're selling to when you like first think about who are who's your target market? And then number one, what are they worried about? I just told you what I'm worried about. I don't feel like I should have I should be doomed to a life of high waters for the rest of my life just because I'm tall. That's something I'm worried about. Right. Therefore, I only buy my clothes from certain places. Simple. I don't have I don't I'm not one of those people. This is going to sound really bad. If I order clothes and they don't fit, the chances of me actually making it back to USPS to ship it back to them is very small because I just don't like a lot of stress. So for me, it takes a lot before I like invest, try with a new brand or whatever to buy online. So I'm worried about, is it gonna fit me well? And I wanna see kind of evidence of it before I order. Either you have a tall section or you tell me that the model is already 5'9 or something like that. So I already know this is not, you know, that is gonna work for me in advance. Like that's something I'm worried about. Um, and so when you answer that question before I even ask you, which of course, you know, most times you can't even get people on the phone. If you answer that question for me, then I'm interested in buying because you focused on me as a, as your niche, right? This is how you get people to buy with your digital marketing. Also, what's their style? What kind of things do they like? Like your target uh, demographic, right? Um, and then what information do they need? So what are they, what, what questions do they have? What kind of information do they need before they move forward, right? And how do they know that you have the answer? People buy from people that they know, like, and trust, right? And so a lot of times when people focus on social media, they're like, oh, yeah, you got to talk about your husband, talk about your dog, talk about this, talk about that. I'm like, for me, I don't necessarily subscribe to that, even though I do share some bits of my life. I crack jokes all the time on my social media. I do share things about my church, about my family. I share things because I want to. So I share what I want to, but not out of obligation, because I also see some digital marketers out there who are killing it 
and nobody knows who their husband is. They just know that they have one. And so it's just like these things are not, I mean, it's not, it's not do or die. It's really just about how you use it and how you appeal to people's market. So I'm not into that frame. I don't know how many people have heard that kind of marketing where it's like, oh, you got to tell your whole life story and you know, use your babies as puppets and all this stuff to sell your products. You don't have to. If you like sharing stuff, I naturally like sharing stuff, so it doesn't bother me. But if you're not comfortable, you don't have to do that to sell your hair product or to sell your service or to tell people that you you can help churches and nonprofits. You don't have to do all of that, but you do have to understand what they worry or what they're worried about, understand their style, understand what information they need, and figure out how to get them to know you, which means that they can find you, like you, meaning that you're relatable, which you can be relatable on your own, just within the things that you're willing to share about yourself and ignore the things you don't wanna share about yourself and how they can trust you, which comes from no, helping them to understand that you have the answers to the information that they need. You can solve the problems that they have. A lot of times we lock everything up and, oh yeah, you gotta pay me $2,000, then I'll show you if I have the answer or not. That's a lot, that's a lot to, you know, I mean, most of y'all probably wouldn't even invest into that. A lot of people, like I said, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even invest $100 into something without knowing that, okay, I can trust this person, right? There's some testimonials or there's something that show this, like maybe testimonials, maybe um, this person has shared information that they know, Sh share what you know online, right? To help people to see like, oh yeah, she actually, she knows what she's talking about. So I'm willing to invest in her, you know? So you have to be able to figure those things out um, by going back to who your niche is. If you don't have a niche, you're gonna be lost in answering these questions, right? If you're like, I'm just trying to sell to everyone under the sun, then, I mean, what are they worried about? All kinds of things. <laughs> What's their style? All kinds of styles. What kind of information do they need? All kinds of information. Like it's just difficult to 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 answer these and to speak in a way that resonates with people enough for them to actually trust you. For years, I've been coaching people one on one, and it was great. You know, it was cool. But a couple of things. Number one. Um, do, the hourly thing wasn't working because one person could take five minutes to explain you know, where they're stuck and their challenges, the next person could take the whole hour to explain where they're stuck, which doesn't really give me a whole lot of time to help them. Um, and, but the bigger thing is that a lot of people were just like, oh, she seems smart, but I, I'm struggling to figure out how she can help me. But once I launched a program for wedding planners, even though I can, I've helped people who are not wedding planners, I hope people are not even in the wedding industry. I feel like, I mean, I can coach anyone, but when I became up with this specific coaching program, then that's when everything grew because I focus on a niche. I took my own advice, right? With focusing on a niche. It took me a while to figure out what that niche, what, what I wanted that niche to be. But once I focused in on that, everything grew, you know? And now I have a thriving coaching practice because, <laughs> because I went from this to this. That's the change, right? And then of course I, I built better infrastructure behind it and all that too. But now I'm known for something specific. So an example. Oh, really sorry. good. Yeah, Faisala, sorry to, to um, interrupt you, but I think you're making some really good points. Thank you so much. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Mary wants to elaborate, but she did ask if you could provide some input on her niche um, and how do you find out their style? I'm not sure what their style is referring to, um, but you do have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, um, let me just take a look. Um, so hello ladies, if I know, okay, sorry. If you could provide input on my niche, perhaps, um, I would probably say, so Mary, if you don't mind maybe typing out what you sell and who you do it for, that would help. Um, so we could go from there. And then also staying on brand by not oversharing is a long-term strategy, absolutely. Um, how do you find out their style? You have to be, the point is to create a client avatar. Right. So and a big way, a, a really great way to start is to look at your past clients, your past clients who you would want to duplicate. If you're like, oh, my gosh, if I could replicate you and all my other clients were you, what, what would they be? Right. Like what aspect of them would they be? Or if there was like two or th my or even actually, that's not my favorite. My favorite is if you can identify maybe a few, two or three, what are the things that they have in common? Right. For us. Our clients are crazy busy. I've planned a wedding for a bride who was deployed and didn't come back until two weeks before the wedding, two months before the wedding. I plan a wedding for a bride who was in medical school out of the country. And um, like, like, li like literally I have some crazy busy clients. I had planned a wedding for a bride who was a lobbyist and she changed jobs. And then two weeks later, Trump got elected and she's a lobbyist in healthcare. And she like vanished. 
you know, for weeks because she was just busy. Like, I don't know how many people remember how it was at the beginning, but everything was about healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. And she was just working around the clock. Like I, but at, at the end of the day, all these weddings still happen and they were so beautiful. The clients were happy. So how do you, so that is one thing that I found common between the clients that I like to work with. Right. And I, and I can help them in a way that works. I'm not the wedding planner who you need to talk to eight times a day, <laughs> you know, 12 before your wedding, I'm texting you for morning tonight. Like I'm not doing that because I understand you're busy. So I have systems that allow me to do it better. So those are, for me, it's really clients that you've already had. What about them? You know, do you, what, 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 is, what is it about them? That's, that's common. And if you don't have clients, pick one. I think my thing is that a lot of people spend so much time trying to perfect this thing. Like, you know, everybody knows someone who was, who's been about to launch this business for like five years, right? And you've been about to do it, about to, oh man, when I launch it, it's going to be fire. Like I'm about to like, no, pick one and just go for it. Because like I, like um, was already said when I shared my, um, the bio, I pivoted, like I've gone from one niche to another, to another. And I mean, when I first started, when I first came to DC, I was, marketing myself as like a budget planner. Like, let me help you even if you have a tight budget because I just wanted to show what I could do. Then after a while, I was like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. No like, this is what I'm doing. Like, you know, like you can change it. But if you never pick one and you're just sitting on the sidelines and you're talking about I've been in business for five years, but you never had any clients, like, what is that doing for you? So sometimes it's just about picking one and then trying it. And then when you realize that you want to do something else, then you can move, right? So I see that Mary has shared that my goal is to help teens, tweens, and young adults produce positive results from past experience by past experiences by way of purposeful writing and speaking. Okay, I think that's great. It's very, um, it's a little vague in what the positive result is, right? So I would probably say I don't know what the positive result is, but I'll probably be um, a little bit clear on that. And then um, this has less to do with marketing more on the business side, but um, I'm not sure how this is like where, first of all, people don't pay premium for things that aren't like very clear, like what the outcome is going to be. Um, so I would probably think about that. And then also whenever it's something for teens, tweens, you know, young adults, you have to figure out how, who's going to pay for it um, and how you're going to get them to pay. So there has to be a clear value proposition. Like people don't even pay premium for hair products, right? Um, unless it's a clear value proposition. Um, there's a reason that I buy the hair products I buy, which are much more than suave, right? Because there's a clear value proposition. So I would probably, um, that's less of a marketing thing, but just something that I think is really common with people who are working in that space. Um, I think that sometimes you have to separate business from charity, right? Um, and so for me, I really believe in finding things that make money and then donating to the things or volunteering my time in the things that don't. So I volunteer a lot of my time in church. I donate to St. Jude's. Like I, the things that matter to me, I do those, but um, I make money in areas that I can make money. And so I would probably, those are, that's just kind of like two cents, a little off topic. Um, but I would say, I think that the marketing is gonna come from being very specific about what that positive result means, right? Because it has to be extremely clear what it is. Is it women, um, is it young teen, you know, helping, helping teens through teen pregnancy? Okay. You know, to get into college? Is it helping people, you know, kids from juvenile detention get, back on track and get into college, right? Because then when you're clear on what the value proposition is, you're clear, for me, I start with what's, what, what review do I want? At the end of the day, even before I started my coaching program, I was like, what do I want people to write about me? What I don't want is for people to be like, oh, she was so nice and the information was so good. I don't want that because that's fluff. Personally, that's not what I want. I want people to be like, man, I worked with her and she transformed my business and I made more money. Or okay. I worked with her, she transformed my business and I saved so much time in my business. It's so clear that then I can work backwards in the marketing for it and also in how I build the program to make sure people get that results, that result, right? So that is kind of where I would go with that um, because that is very different from positive result. I believe that good marketing, when you, good marketing means you're thinking for people because again, especially on social media, when people see something and it's vague, they don't understand it, you just keep scrolling. They're not gonna sit there and be like, what does she mean by positive? Mm -hmm. 
let me think about it. Let me think about some examples of positive results I want for my kids and then go back to her and ask if she can do it. No one's going to do that, especially if they don't know you, especially if they encounter you through a hashtag or something. They don't, they are not already connected with you. They're not going to ask those questions. They're just going to keep scrolling. But when someone says, has your child gone through the juvenile detention system and need help, you know, working out, you know, how to get into a private school or working out how to get into like private, you know, um, high school or how to get into college or this and that, or, you know, this is something that I can help you with, then that's clear. That's a very valuable problem to solve, right? And that's gonna get my attention. And if I don't have a child who's gone through that and I know someone who has, I'm gonna forward it to them. Okay. Right, so that is that is literally what we're talking about today as far as like marketing to a niche. You gotta be very specific because that's what gets people's attention. Okay, thank you. Hey. Okay. Hey, Faisal, I had a question. Are you going to talk about like um, customer segmentation at all and what that looks like? Um, I wasn't. I mean, I think um, we, I wasn't because I think that I don't know how many people, <laughs> how many people here have email lists. Um, so I would, you know, that kind of requires having an, an email list kind of to segment, um, you know, to segment that, but that's, that's a great thing to do as well. Um, just at a, at a high level, you know, it's something that I do in my newsletter, there are people who join, you know, just because they wanted some kind of freebie. There are people who join specifically for uh, systems and tools that have to do with wedding planning specifically. So those are the people that I target for my wedding planning program. Everybody else, I just give general updates on my life, general business tips to keep them engaged until I have something else to sell them. So it's yeah. like knowing who everyone is using, I use tags and sequences. I use a tool called ConvertKit. I used to use MailChimp. It doesn't really matter what you use, but just being clear that, oh, I'm trying to sell this type of person this, I'm trying to sell this type of person this, and I'm trying to sell this type of person that. That's what segmentation is. It's a little challenging to do that on social media. Um, and it's also not really something you can do in SEO because you're just putting up a website, but it's something you can do on the back end. You can have one contact form that goes to one part of your list and another contact form that goes to another part of your list. So you forever know where they came in and what kind of stuff you should sell to them. Um, that's a little, that's like, it's probably not marketing 101. It's probably going into marketing like, 301. 301. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much what, you know, what that is. But that comes after you have a newsletter, after you have a list of, uh, you know, people's emails to sell to. Yeah. I was just going to say really quickly, um, I see Mary stepped away. I don't know if she can hear, but I've found that with some of the other women in our community, okay. applying customer segmentation in the way that they do their digital marketing helps with team programs. Because sometimes with like youth oriented stuff, People think that they're talking to the youth, but the youth are not in position to actually pay for the services. Mm -hmm. And so by segmenting, saying that we're talking to parents and we're using this type of strategy, and then we're talking to youth centers or rec centers or churches, we can come up with a model where we can contract our services rather and apply kind of a B2B model, business to business model, rather than trying to speak to each person or each youth on a social media platform. Um, and what that looks like sometimes, like you said, uh, facial on the back end is sometimes it's not the obvious, like being on Instagram because we think that the youth are hanging out there, mm -hmm. but it might mean having a presence on like TikTok to talk to the youth, but then creating strategies on like Facebook and Instagram where their parents are and developing a strategy around that. I don't know if that's helpful, but I have found that that's a common question mm -hmm. from others who work in youth spaces in the community. Yep. And that's that's where I was going. That was kind of where I was going when I said who's going to pay for it, right? Because I mean, even if it's a hundred dollars, which I don't think, depending on how deep you're going with people, I don't know if a hundred dollars is, is ever going to be sufficient for what you offer. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if it's a hundred dollars, like a, a young person who's just gone through teen pregnancy and can barely afford diapers is not going to pay for that. And right. maybe it's someone who just made it out of juvenile detention. So you have to think about who is going to pay for this. Mm -hmm. Like you have to like, you, and that's who you have to talk to. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the first questions I ask when I speak to a bride is who's paying for this wedding? I mean, most of my clients pay for their own wedding. So that changes a lot. But if it's not you, I might, you know, let's maybe have a follow up with the person who is going to pay for it. So they understand the value and the importance of it, you know, type of thing. So th those, I mean, that's, that, that's, that goes back into who your target market is. So if your goal is for teens, tweens, and young, well, young adults might be different. They might have the money, but teens and tweens, I don't think your target market is even the teens, honestly. I think it's the parents um, and the other groups because they're the ones who are going to pay for it. Um, and even if it was free, uh, sometimes teens and, you know, 
just, you know, we, we've all been young before. Um, sometimes you've just already decided, oh, this is just who I am. I can't change it. I don't feel right. like changing it. I don't feel like going through the work. You still need someone else to encourage you through it. So mm -hmm. I still think, I don't know if your target market is the actual teen. <laughs> it might be the parents or other youth programs mm -hmm. that you mentioned. So I hope that helps. Um, and I think that, and I hope that this exercise was helpful for everybody. Like, you know, you have to go back, who is paying for it and what, it, what are the specific, what are some examples of specific problems that people need to solve, right? So for myself, just like I was saying, like my coaching business has grown a lot because I focus on wedding planners. Then other people come and they're like, all the wedding planners in your program are saying that, you know, they keep getting hits on their website, right? That they before, they were just scrambling to get hits from Instagram and now people are finding them on Google, right? They're getting all these inquiries. It's their ideal client. It's this, it's that. Can you help me? Of course I can help you. So then I have another service that's specific to that, right? That, But it's still even that's still specific. I don't just say I'm a general business coach because I'm not. I'm helping, not to say I can't help you with other things, but I've, I've picked, I've decided the outcome before I sold it. That's what you do when you're marketing to a niche. This is, I've already decided this is the outcome you get when you buy this. I already know the outcome I'm going to get when I buy Shea Moisture products. And I know it's slightly different than when I buy Suave. So therefore, I buy Shea Moisture because <laughs> I have natural hair. You know, like that's, that's, that's the goal. And, you know, it's just, that's the thought process that you kind of have to get into. So I'm, 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 I'm really glad this is helpful. I'm going to hop back into the presentation real quick. I just wanted to, um, I wanted to, kind of turn that off while I was answering those. So, um, okay, so a sample target market statement is ours. We're a planning and design company that specializes in met weddings for the modern multicultural couple. Now this is just a target market statement, but the reason we use this is because a lot of our clients are intercultural, meaning we've done Nigerian Jewish, we've done Ethiopian Pakistani, Trini Salvadorian, we've done a lot of mixed cultures. So the modern multicultural person, you know, marries outside of their ethnicity it happens a lot, right? The world's getting smaller, it's a melting pot, this is what's happening. Also multicultural meaning people who are maybe not necessarily from America, right? So maybe two Ethiopian people getting married or two Caribbean people getting married. Also, a lot of our clients want to support vendors of color. So a lot of our clients at least want the bride or the groom is of color and they wanna support vendors of color, right? That's where they want their money to go. And we, and we can help them to find trusted vendors of color. And that's a few of the things that are kind of encompassed in that statement. The reason this statement is short is because on Twitter and Instagram, you only have a little bit of time to say what you got to say. Uh, but of course, on your about pages and in all of that, you want to elaborate more. And these are the sorts of themes that you want to have in your um, Instagram posts, in your blog posts, right? Making sure that it's pointing back to this general you know, target market statement. Um, so it's really, the target market station really is to center you. And then it's also great for like your bio for social, social media sites where it has to be really short. Um, so some common misconceptions about marketing to a niche. Number one, I don't wanna pigeonhole myself and I want diverse clientele. The second one is I already don't have enough clients. So I want everybody to know that I'm available and to inquire for me. Another common misconception is I don't wanna get stuck. And what if I want to change my niche later? Or what if I want to take on different clients? Like, I just don't want to get stuck, right? And the last one is I don't have the time to define a target market because I'm too busy. So these are very common reasons. Even if you don't say it out loud, these are common things in people's heads why they don't really focus on a niche. They don't really focus on what, you know, who they're selling to. They're just like, let me just post a thousand things and someone will come. And they never take the time to do this, right? So I want to say, let me talk about Tosin and Davey. So when um, Andrina was reading my bio, she did mention that um, I have, um, I initially had my specialty in Nigerian weddings. And the reason is because I started my business shortly after winning, media, um, winning a Nigerian beauty pageant, right? So I started with what I had, right? It's, it's even scriptural. I feel like there's so many people in the Bible who like look to a prophet or look to God for something. And the answer was use what you have, right? And what was in front of me was Nigerian people. Um, not only am I Nigerian, but that was just who I was exposed to. So I just started with what I had, which was Nigerian people. Um, it wasn't that that's what I wanted forever, but I was like, I'm gonna start with that. So I built a specialty in Nigerian weddings, working on weddings for Nigerian clients and being happy to do it, you know, um, the festivity and everything of it. Um, but then I got an inquiry from, and this was actually a referral from an MC um, whose wedding I also planned. And it was a Nigerian bride and a, a Jewish groom. And I was like, great. And the reason they wanted me was not only was I recommended, but because I had experience with Nigerian weddings, right? That was the main reason that they wanted me. 
Um, and so I worked on their wedding and I posted a couple of things during the wedding day and also the, yeah, during the wedding day, one of the pictures went crazy viral. I wasn't even expecting it. I just posted it, closed my phone, you know, went about running around. And when I opened my phone, I was like, yo, what's going on? <laughs> like all these new followers, like all these reposts. I was like, well, like what, what, I don't understand what's happening. Um, and it was because no one had ever seen a Nigerian person marry a Jewish man. I mean, even when I got the inquiry, I was like, is he like, is he like not practicing? Like I was even confused. I was like, I thought Jewish people had to marry each other. Like it was just, you know, and not marry someone who's not Jewish, like, um, by religion because she's she's not and she never she didn't convert even so I was just like the whole thing was just fascinating to me but I didn't realize that it was also fascinating to the rest of the world um, and it was different and it was refreshing to see and so after that um, every time I would post them or share about them I got more people who were planning cross-cultural events coming my way and I was excited about it because like I said I like I just like it I even tell people in consultations like we specialize in this because we think it's fun and we like to celebrate people's cultures I don't even like sugarcoat it like I'm the best in the game even though I think I am but still like I just tell them that we like to do it and it that is a big part of how I pivoted out of this but the only reason I got this client in the first place was because I had a specialty in Nigerian weddings so a lot of times you, you can't, like a lot of times like you can pivot once you're good at where you start. So start with something, be good at it, be memorable, you know, let people like you. Like I said, the person who, in, who referred me to them, I planned their wedding and they were happy with, with how it came out. So I did a good job. That's marketing in and of itself, doing a good job. Then get the referral and then you start to pivot based off of what comes to you and what feels good and what you're like, yeah, I'd like to do more of this. That exercise I said earlier about picking a few of your clients and saying, oh, if I could do more of these kinds of weddings, what's common about them? You don't do it just once in your business. I would probably do that every couple of years, if not every year, sit down and say, all right, looking back over this year, what do I wanna do less of? What do I wanna do more of? And then adjust your marketing accordingly. So you're not gonna pigeonhole yourself by picking a niche, you're actually probably gonna get closer to where you wanna go and find people who are more willing to work with you and who relate with you um, and wanna stay connected with you, right? So some best practices for Mark. So hopefully that crushes any thoughts or any concerns anyone has about not picking a niche and marketing to that niche. So best practices for marketing to passive searchers, people who are just hanging out on the web, you know, uh, which is generally, this is the kind of tips that I think most people are generally looking for. Number one, this is so important, write it down, circle it, underline it, do whatever you gotta do, put a sticky note on the wall, but share content consistently. Because remember, people are waiting for what hits their timeline. They're not always looking for you. If you're focused on this person who's just passively waiting for things to hit their timeline, you have to post consistently. One thing, and it doesn't matter how many times I say this, because I've, I've given different variations of this presentation a few times. It doesn't matter how many times I say this, I always see somebody do this. One thing that's very common after listening to a marketing presentation is to go on Instagram. And for the next three days, you just flood everybody with stuff because you're inspired. And after that, you go back to posting once a month. That is not going to help you. It's not. It's much better to post three posts a week for a month or you know, seven posts a week for a month or whatever than to post 12 posts all in one day and log out because you want your content to hit people's timeline, right? Which means you gotta be consistent. And so that's, that's where I'm gonna start with that, right? You wanna be available posts at some frequency so that that person who logs into Instagram a couple times a week or once a day or whatever, they have an opportunity to see something that you did over and over and over again. So when they're ready, they remember you. When they're ready, when they're ready to hire you or when a friend is ready to hire you, I don't know how many people come to me saying, oh, a friend told me about you. And I'm like, oh, who's the friend? And it's someone that I've never heard of. So it's just someone who's just following me and then they refer, right? Um, so that happens a lot. Another thing that's really important, share more of what you want to do and less of what you don't. Consumers of today are extremely visual and they need to see things similar to their style and what they want before they choose to hire you. So like I said, I didn't want to do budget events anymore. So I stopped talking about people's budgets in my posts. Started talking about the beauty and the elegance and all of that because I didn't want more budget weddings. So posts, I mean, there, then there was also a time I learned this lesson. There was one time I, I, uh, I was designing for a client. I used to do floral design as well. Um, and I decided to, uh, you know, some years ago when I really wanted to get into more luxury events. I feel like when you get into more luxury, people don't want um, service providers to do two things. They wanna know you're the best at one. So I've decided to hunker down on wedding planning. 
because it was a time that I, you know, I posted a social media post of me spray painting branches, right? Because it was an, a silver event. So I posted me spray painting branches to prepare for an event that weekend. And so a few months later, someone came to me and said, oh yeah, I know that you do a lot of DIY type stuff to save your clients money. And I was like, no, I don't. I do it just because that's the color I wanted. Like, this is not to save you money, but it was like, so I started to not share certain things or to not share it in a certain way, right? Almost like if I was to share that again, I would say, man, we put in so much work. This is, this is what you're paying for when you pay for the labor part or whatever, right? So focusing on what I want more of as opposed to what I want less of. If you don't want to do boho chic things or you don't want to do, um, I don't know. If you want to do more of something, post more of it. If you want to do less of something, post less of it. It's really important. Also taking cell phone photos of your work whenever you can. So you don't always have to rely on a photographer or a videographer. A lot of times people are like, oh, I got to wait for my next photo shoot. And I'm like, that no, it doesn't make sense. Instagram, it's like instant, gram, instant. So the faster you post something, the more people are like, oh, that's so cool. Did you see she made cookies for this event yesterday or she made cookies for this event today and she already posted it and I thought it was so cool. People are, are attracted to people who are busy. So take your own stuff. I mean, listen, um, pictures of nowadays, photos, you know, cameras of nowadays can do, do amazing things. So use it. Like, don't be like, oh, this photographer didn't send me something, so I'm not going to do anything. One time I was invited to um, a venue to, um, they invited a bunch of event planners when I first moved out here. So I went and I, I wasn't familiar with this venue, but when I got there, I, it was beautiful. And then also they allowed outside food. So I was like, this is perfect for my target market, right? Africans wanting to have African food. So I took my little rinky dink Blackberry at the time, because that's what I had. And I took pictures in every room. I took notes and I went home and I wrote a blog post and that blog post made me money because someone found that blog post with my rinky dink pictures, but all my descriptions about what made this venue a, a beautiful choice for um, African weddings. And then that person remembered it. He got engaged um, uh, maybe eight months later and reached out to me, told me that they wanted to go with that venue and that they wanted to go with me. No questions asked, sign the contract and we move forward, right? Because I showed what I knew, right? People go with people they know, like, and trust. I showed what I knew, helped to build trust. And then after that, they started following me on social media and then decided, to hire me. So share, take cell phone photos of anything, show what you know, find ways to show what you know. That's marketing, right? Because ultimately you're trying to build that know, like, and trust factor. And goodness, as far as converting followers into buyers, please make sure that there is a link to your website in your bio, preferably a link to a sales page, a link to your shop, a link to your contact form. A lot of people are like, I don't know why I'm not getting clients. And I look at their Instagram page and this goes to the last point here. The page is private, so I can't even see what you sell. You don't have a link in your bio. You don't have the contact things enabled. So I can't call you, I can't email you. And your bio doesn't even say what you do. So here's the thing, a lot of people, um, I mean, there are a lot of people who post just, who, who just have inspiration pages, right? They just give, they just like to inspire people. So if you don't make it clear that you're selling anything, no one's going to buy. And if you don't make it easy, they're also not going to buy. I don't buy from people that don't make it easy. For me, when I call people and they're doing too much back and forth and there's too much things that don't make sense, I don't buy from that. I just find somebody else who, who understands it and who I can just explain things to easily and they'll, they'll, they'll pick it up, right? So if you have a Facebook page, you have an Instagram page, you have all these things, but there's no clear way from people to buy from you, or if they can't buy initially, if you have to draft a proposal first, you don't have a link to your contact form and they have to jump through hoops to figure out how to contact you. No, you're not getting, you're, you are literally losing money. And that's like a big reason that people lose money. Another thing you wanna do, call to action occasionally, right? Maybe every nine posts, let people know, click the link in my bio to learn more about working with me. You know, DM me or whatever you wanna do, but you know, with DMs, sometimes you lose people, you go back and forth a little bit and then they ghost or whatever. So what you really want is for them to, you want their contact, you want their email, you want their phone number, get them to fill out your contact form, get them to your shop. Don't make, don't make people hop through hoops, right? So you look at your own Instagram, your own Facebook page and see if I was a buyer, would I know what to do next? And if the answer is no, make sure that you update, make sure your profile is public, make sure there's a link to your website and your bio. If you have private stuff on there and you're like, oh, I don't want people to see my kids, whatever, either delete it or create a new page for your business. But I mean, you at a certain point, you just gotta pick. 
like because no one's jumping through hoops to, to to buy anything right and another thing is that you want a clear bio that says what you do and who you do it for and your location especially if you sell something that's localized i mean people need to know where you where you live if you have a hair salon right like if you don't put where you live it's kind of hard for people to be like oh i want her to, to do my hair you know because i don't know how far i'm have to drive to get you so those are some things that you definitely want to do for the passive searchers now for people who when you're marketing to active searchers people who are searching for what you do you want to research keywords and hashtags, right? So for instance, London hairstylist is great. It's a great thing to use in your SEO, even better for your um, for your, um, for your social media, right? So people can find you if they're searching for a London hairstylist on social media, right? Those are the sorts of things, DC restaurant, all those sorts of things help people to, you know, it helps you to be in front of your target customer as they're looking for you. Another thing is creating hyper specific keywords like Indian photographer in Maryland, right? Versus luxury photographer. No one's searching for luxury photographer, but a lot of people are probably searching for Indian photographer in Maryland. Luxury photographer doesn't even say where you live, doesn't even say nothing, right? So those are those are some things you wanna focus on with your online marketing. Um, using target keywords if your title, keyword, and content on different pages on your website. Like I said, this might be like, what is she talking about? But I offer a whole service where we could get this done for you like in a day. Um, so if you're interested, if you're right, willing to just invest to get it done, we could do it. Otherwise, these are some tips for you to do it yourself. Um, also, you want to caption your Pinterest images with words that reference your keywords, right? Um, you may not want, you know, the things that you post, you may not want to just be like, oh, pretty vase. You may want to post it as, you know, custom pottery artwork, you know, available in the US or something like that. So the people who are searching for that can find you. Um, and then also the same thing with your YouTube, making sure that your keywords are in the title and the description and all that stuff on YouTube. So people who are searching for what you do can find you. Because those those are the places that people search, right? On so people search on social media through hashtags, people search on um, Google, which goes back to your SEO for your website, people search on um, your Pinterest on Pinterest and of course people search on YouTube. Both of those are search engines. Um, so those are some tips on what exactly to do to make sure you're getting these people based off of after you've figured out your niche, figured out what they're looking for and all of that. These are things that you can do to get in front of people. Now doing this alone without having done the work of who's your target market and what you're selling to them is not going to help you. Every time I search for, search for things online, I find people who are, I'm just like, I would never work with you, right? You never really specified how you're going to get me a result or anything like your website to mess whatever um but i found you you ranked because you used the hashtag but you you're not speaking my language so i'm not going to buy right so getting you to actually buy comes from knowing what they need and speaking to that the content is what gets people to buy these tactics is what gets people to find you so you need both now so four tips to get you started on your niche marketing then i'll take some questions number one how do you want people to contact you make sure that is in your bio and is on each page of your website a lot of times people are like, oh, people call me and I just get frustrated because I'm driving and people just call me off the on the fly. Maybe your phone number shouldn't be on your website. I don't know. If you don't want people to call you at, as the first step, then don't tell them to call. Like I literally see them, they're like, call me for more information. I'm like, and then when I talk to them, they're like, oh, I really wish people would email me. I'm like, you're the one who told them to call you. And it's probably because the website template said, call me. And you didn't even think about it. Like, how do you want people to contact you and make sure that's what you put on your bio and that's on each page of your website so people don't have to do too much to contact you. Second thing, what's your mission statement and why do you do what you do? This is something that helps people to connect with you and that gets into that like part of the know, like, and trust. Why do you do what you do? What's your mission statement, right? What are you trying to accomplish on this earth? Make sure that's on the about page of your website and also make sure it's somewhere in your social media bio or your Friday introductions and those sorts of things so people can get to know you and like you. Now, number three, showcase projects of your target niche, right? So whatever your target niche is that you're trying to go after, make sure you showcase those type of projects over and over and over again. So select your favorite photos from those galleries, from those, um, you know, even works on your cell phone, whatever, and drip it on social media. Not all at once. Make sure you are dripping so that you're finding some level of consistency. I don't care if it's three times a week. I don't care if it's three times a day, but being somewhat consistent so that you're constantly in front of people versus being like, oh, I want to do this great social media workshop. So let me just put 30 things on social media and then I'm going to close my laptop and not open it again until 2022. Don't do that. Make sure you're dripping and you're consistent. Also, what tips can you share with your target market? What kind of tips can you share with them? And specifically, what kind of tips can you share with them that helps them to be ready to work with you, right? Um, share those sorts of things on Pinterest, share them on YouTube and share them on your blog because your blog is also a great um, lead magnet, right? If you use SEO the right way. So share those things 
tips to get people ready to work with you um, so they get to know, like, and trust you. And then when they're ready to buy, you're top of mind. So these are some things that will get you started on niche marketing and things that you should focus on, things that you should be doing. Um, and at this point, I'd like to know if anyone has any additional questions. <laughs> Any? All right. I have a question. Okay. I always have a question. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was so thorough. I, I appreciate that. Um, it was very comprehensive. So for people who are in a different industry, so let's say people who are in the nonprofit space, um, do you have any advice for them specifically? Like, how do you make sure that you are targeted for your industry? Like, are there best practices? Is there some place that they can go to get more information about just industry specific best practices? So industry specific for nonprofits? Yeah, for nonprofits. So we have, I think, a couple of coaches on here. Um, Grace, she's in a floral business, so she's not nonprofit. But how do you know, I guess, where to go based on what your industry is and what type of organization you are? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it goes back to who is your target market, right? So if you're a nonprofit, then your target market is the person that's, that's going to pay you. I'm going to start with that, right? There's a difference between the people who are, and when you're in a nonprofit, there's a difference between the people who are using your service and the people who are going to pay you. Right. So there's all the, and that goes back to even what we were talking about with the parents and guardians, like the people who are going to pay you are the parents and the people who are going to kind of benefit from the service are the, are the children. Uh, or also some schools may pay for that. Um, some after school programs may pay for that, but it's adults <laughs> that are going to pay for it. And then the teens are going to benefit from it. Similarly, with a nonprofit, who is going to pay you for what you did, right? Maybe a grant from the government, because what you're doing is in line with something that is a priority from your governor, right? Or a priority for your city or a priority for your, um, or even possibly even, I don't know if there are even our national grants, but possibly, right? Like what is a, a priority for different places? For um, for instance, I know that there, there are just so many different grants and you have to figure out who is my, my client. Um, also, how are you going to generate uh, money? I, I actually used to work for a nonprofit. I used to work for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and most of their money came from donors. Um, and also they invested. So the, I don't I don't know all the details because I was in IT, so study engineering, but I know that I believe as a nonprofit, investing is probably a good strategy. And then they also had a customer of um, of um, uh, royalties because they the, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, they, they study a very rare disease. And because it's rare, it's not a big money maker in the research space because people don't want to put in all the money to research for this disease that's so rare. So the foundation does its own research. But once they find things that work, they sell the royalties to a pharmaceutical company to, to make for them. So they make more money from the royalties and the pharmaceutical company doesn't lose money in research. So that's what they do. So in all of that, they figured out their customer, right? Like a good customer is a pharmaceutical company that doesn't that doesn't want to do research, but they will buy, they'll pay the royalties to produce it because it's profitable for both. They figured out their customer of um, kind of, I guess, of investing. I don't know if that's a customer, but that's a it's an income source, right? That's another place they focus on income. And then events, people who rich people who just like going to fancy galas, like this is a person plans some pretty fancy events all around the world. Um, and so people who just want to be like, oh, you know, I supported a nonprofit this month and I went to this fancy gala and I dressed up and I'm an important person and they don't have a problem dropping $500 for a ticket for an event. I mean, I don't know if CFF charges that much for their events, but I, I actually supported a nonprofit um, in the past for their fundraising event and the tickets were $500. There was an early bird ticket option for 250 that was only available for like a week, but every, every other time it was $500. So it was just being there made you somebody because they created this elite experience. And so if you have a room full of somebodies, you're gonna make money. Not, not only are you going to make money from the ticket sales, it was at the St. Regis in New York. I mean, so they've, they created a whole nother segment of customers, people who want something. They want to be able to go to this event and show, you know, and be like, okay, yeah, this is like, someone told me like, oh, yeah, this is like the Grammys. This is like the African Grammys, like when you come to this event, because it's like anyone who someone is here, because if you're not here, that means you don't have, you don't have $500 to spend. 
you know, that's kind of the way people, that's kind of the, I don't know if this was necessarily what the organizer was going for, but this is what it became because she planned, she, because she, and she never planned the cheap events. It was, she never planned the, oh, $50 to attend event. It was always 500 with an early bird option for those who really wanted to come, right? And so those were, that's, you know, that's literally how, you know, that's where the money came from. So the target market, again, is events. Sometimes the target market is other donors. People may do donate for other reasons. Um, I see someone saying, you know, storytelling, that's great, but you have to have people's phone number. You have to have people's contact first in order to tell the story to them, uh, which is the tricky part. But that's something that the foundation, you know, that I work for did a great job of too, right? You get, have this event, all these people come, they come, it's fancy, whatever. And now they're in your database. You tell stories about how their donation did this for them, did that for them. I get stuff from St. Jude all the time telling me about things that happen. And the storytelling is, I mean, I'm on auto pay with them, honestly. So even if they, you know, whatever, I'm just on auto pay with them. But for people who manually pay each time, that storytelling helps to con help them to continue to pay. But it's, but you have to figure out who your clients are first, right? Um, also storytelling in certain other ways too. I've discovered St. Jude because a long time ago when I first gave my life to Christ, I used to listen to Praise, which I think they have it in different cities, but I was listening to Praise in New York because I used to live in New York. And they did their, they say, they usually do this telethon with St. Jude where it's like all day they tell stories, tell stories all day. I don't know if, I don't know if they pay for that slot or if they give it to them for free. I don't know how that works, but also St. Jude is a very big nonprofit. So I don't know, you know, if you're running a smaller nonprofit, it may be hard to get like an all day segment on a radio station to do a telethon, right? That's why I'm giving other options, but I discovered from just hearing those stories and I was just like oh my gosh I don't know what I would ever do if I had a child who had I, I don't have children yet but I was just like I just can't even imagine it so I do love the idea of people being able to treat their children and not ever having to pay or worry about paying so of course so for me it was like a no-brainer yeah I'll, I'll give you my credit card you know um and and when I switch credit cards whenever my credit card expires they're the first ones I call like can you make sure that like you switch because I care about it right so storytelling is important but you have to get people's attention somehow radio slots are expensive like a lot of things are expensive so if you're in a more grassroots level you have to figure out what it what how am I, who is my, like, who am I selling to? Because as a nonprofit, you're still selling to somebody. You're either selling to the government because you're doing something that aids some initiative that they have going on right now, or you're selling to parents or other organizations, not forgetting that a lot of other organizations are in the same place that you are, where they also are strapped for cash, right? And trying to find it. So that's something to keep in mind, but targeting the right organizations that can pay. And then also, I mean, that's why fundraising events were a big thing. And I know they're gonna come back now that the pandemic is, has wrapped up, but you have to figure out your thing, right? Like as far as, or multiple things that will get people to pay. Cause I mean, the truth, which is, it's a little bit of a harsh truth, but there's so many things to donate to. You could, I could donate to, to save the planet, donate to water projects in Africa. I could donate to help inner city kids. Like there's so, I could donate to, you know, to help dogs, you know, who are hungry. Like there's just so many things. So how are you gonna stand out? Right. Yeah. So I to me, that's where I would that's where I would start. Like I think that you it's you still have to figure out who your customer is. It's just that your customer is not the person who's benefiting from what you provide. So you have to figure out some other kind of benefit. The storytelling feeds to people's peace of mind, right? The reason I continue to give to St. To Jude is because I mean, I just had that moment and I just was like, I'm gonna forever give to St. Jude, right? That's just the way I, I felt about it. But then the, um, but many people gave, you know, because of that storytelling, but that was because they had this big platform and I was able to hear the story. Now, fundraising events, the, you know, the big allure, the secret sauce, which a lot of people don't understand about fundraising events, it's gotta be elite. If it's gotta be, if it's the place that everybody's just gotta be, you know, I'm stepping out, I'm fancy tonight, like that, so making an expensive ticket um, and then also continuing to fundraise during the event, not just the tickets, you know, you're, you're providing an experience, even though you're taking, you know, yes, you're, you're not taking people's money, you're providing something, you're giving them, you're, you're putting them on this platform, like they, they spent, you know, they went to this must, you know, this place where you just had to be there. If you were anybody, you were, you know, any, everybody who's everybody in this circle was there. So next time you want to be there, like it's just creating that experience and you just have to figure out who your customer is and what they want as well. The same way that when you're selling to teens and all that, you have to figure out who your client is, who's the parent and what do they want, which may not necessarily be what the teens want. It's the same thing with a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the people who are actually going to pay you, what do they want? Which may not be the same thing as the people you're serving. So That's we so have a lot of homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so good. So, so good. A couple of things that you said that kind of stood out to me. So is this whole idea of FOMO, fear of missing out. And a lot of times people will apply that to elite fundraising events. But I think the backside is what makes social media works. So whether it's like the fear of missing out connection to somebody or having insight to somebody's life, even with celebrities, like it's not just events. Like we want to be connected because we want to feel like we're in the know with people. And good storytelling does, does help with that no matter what industry you're in. In my experience, I always tell the story of uh, year three when my business was struggling a lot. We spent the last $2,000 that we had or that I had um, in traditional marketing, somebody pitched us this beautiful idea. And in 90 days, we didn't even get one inquiry, much less a customer. And so um, a friend of mine who's a social media influencer, kind of at the top of her game at that time, said, you need to focus on social media. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And so, you know, the idea of ROI, right? So return on investment. We didn't have a financial investment to give to social media marketing, but we had nothing but ample time because we weren't getting any customers. And so by putting that time into that, we started to see the return. The phone started ringing, the emails, and that was when we started to see the turnaround in business. And so storytelling does help. Consistency does help. Clarity helps. Um, a lot of what Kayishola has said um, tonight, I can personally attest that if you put in the work, um, you can definitely see some conversion. So thank you. Mm -hmm. No, 100%, 100%. Now, I've definitely spent money on a whole lot of things that uh, I shouldn't have, but you know, we, we learn, the, you know, you, you live and you learn. Um, yeah, I spent money like, oh yeah, like this magazine's gonna make me famous and then they just didn't. Um, and, and then it wasn't until I stopped spending with them that I actually got featured in there. Cause it was just like, I focused on, I focused on what's on the inside as opposed to being like, oh, this person's gonna fix it for me. So once I started focusing on what I can control, that was different. And it's similar. That's even why I even believe in coaching. I'm in a coaching program myself, a very expensive one, but it's just like, I want to learn how to, I want to, I want you to teach me how to fish. I don't want to rely on you to just do it for me. Right. And so every time I do that, I grow and things, you know, my income, everything goes up every time I focus on that, you know, so yeah, definitely, really. I definitely did the whole $2,000 for some listing that didn't do nothing for me. Um, that mm -hmm. one, I didn't have money, like, I, I, whatever. So, yeah, I've definitely been there, done that. Um, and, and now focusing on my own stuff helps because then when people find me, they find me on my on the things that I own. They find me on the Instagram page that I own. They find me on my website that I own, right? And then they click around on stuff that I own versus relying on other other people where they could find me on wedding wire and two seconds later they're on somebody else's page because I don't own it. But they're on a place that I own. So everywhere they click around in there, they're just gonna see more about me. Oh, she has a team. Oh, she was on a magazine. Oh, she did like you're just see, I'm just re you're reinforcing the same thing. Um, and I think that just having that mindset of, you know, I'm gonna build something, build in places that I own is really important. Yep. Yep. And that that whole FOMO, like people are superficial. We're a very superficial culture. And so you almost have to manipulate it so that they want more of you like whatever that looks like, you know, so they turn on their notifications so that they're Googling you. Um, like they don't want to miss out because you're doing so much or you look like you just, you know, have so much going for you. And it's sometimes, you know, and I, I'll be trying to transparent about that in business. I've seen a lot of people and it's a facade, right? But the facade works. There's a reason why, you know, influencer strategy works. <laughs> because if you can get people to believe that you are the hype, then they'll, they'll, they'll put their dollars behind you. Um, and a lot of this is, is just strategy. It's not lying, it's, it's strategy. It's very strategic, using buzzwords, right? Having graphics that are consistent with the tone and the culture of your business, um, putting your best testimonials forward, like making sure that you go the extra mile to make sure that the aesthetic of the page is good, the backend SEO, again, all of it is synchronized and it works well together, it works. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, the, the best quote that I could say from one of my friends, Roxanne, she's an officiant, I'm married by Rev Roxy, but she's amazing. And she's just like, I don't think, she's like, there's so many people, like, what is the point of being the best at what you do if no one knows it? 
you know, and I think that a lot of people have this whole false humility thing going on where it's just like, oh yeah, I'm really good at what I do, but don't worry, you know, I'm okay just over here in this corner. And you just have this whole false humility thing going on and it's not working. I mean, for me, like right now I'm running this coaching program. I've never charged this much for my coaching before, but the results that people are getting it's crazy. And there's so I every I even posted one of my stories today. Every day I get emails from my clients who are like, I am so happy that I stumbled upon you. Like I even got an email from my client last week saying, I'm so happy that you challenged me when I said I couldn't afford this program, which I didn't say go. I, I don't tell people go into debt, whatever. I just said, just consider that if you join and if you really put in the work, you can make all the money back within within two months, honestly. And she did. She hasn't made more than that within two months, but joining, doing, doing the work. And she's like, I just, she, and she literally came back and said, I am happy that you pushed me to, to this because, and I, which helped me because I usually don't push. I use, I feel bad for pushing, but it's just, it's, it's more than just, I don't even know if I would, if, if, you know, I would probably use a different word than it's a facade or if it's manipulating. If you do a good job, now, if you don't do a good job, that's a whole different thing. If you know that you know that you know that what you're selling works. You, like, I feel bad when I see someone whose business is failing and I present to them something and they're like, oh, I'm just going to wait. Or I'm just, I feel bad for them because I'm like, this is going to work. I Like, that's how much I believe in what I do. I feel bad for you. So I, I can release you, but I'm just like, man, I feel bad for her because she's going to go around the circle again for another year or two before she, she figures it out, you know? So if you, if what you are doing works, it's not a facade. It's not anything. You are just, you're doing people a service by making yourself findable so they can find you, they can use you and they get an answer to their problem. As business owners, we're solving a problem. So it's not like, and so as long as you can commit to helping someone to solve that problem, it's, it's a good thing. You know, even the Bible says, who lights a candle and then hides it? What is the point? There's no point. So he's like, don't you put it on a hill so that everyone can see. What is the point of halfway doing stuff and worrying about, oh, I'm not trying to be like these people who like, you know, they present a facade or whatever. Let them be them. If they want to present a facade, whatever. But if you know that what you're doing can help somebody, it's, it's real. You all you're doing is putting it out there so that people can see your light and, and follow it and help them. Like, you know, that's just me. And that's just, I just think that sometimes it's the, it's the way you see it. And I think that with, with, with women and especially Christians, a lot of times we think that having money is a bad thing. And it's like, oh, selling is a, when people hear the word selling, they think of like the car salesman who's like trying to sell you this car that doesn't even work and all this stuff. And it's just like, no, no, all you're doing is shining your light. That's so good. So, so good. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes um, on social media is, you know, know your worth and then add tax to it. And I think that's probably, um, you know, essentially the point of what you're saying, uh, Faishala, is like, know who you are and know the, the value of the product or the service that you're creating, and then brag on it a little bit. Um, I think good branding works when you're able to do that. I think that people can sense authenticity. I get so many people, so many clients who come to us to fix what other people scam them out of, you know, because like one of our brand pillars is integrity. And so you do have to be kind of leery. Don't just make decisions. And this is Andrina speaking um, about things that you purchase on social media. Don't believe the hype. Don't fall into the comparison trap you know, of like, oh, this organization is doing so well because their social media looks so great because things are not always as they appear. Um, but I think you make some excellent points, Faishola, which is know your worth and then add tax. Um, we all like innately have these gifts and talents that God has deposited in us. And it's our responsibility to steward them well um, by offering them to the world. And if you can't do that, then you squandered. You squandered some opportunities. So Thank you so, 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 so much. This was great. Um, and if you all can just help me in just appreciating and acknowledging that she did a good job. Um, this was your first time, I think, working with McQuinn, but it's a pleasure. Um, if nobody else, well, let me say, does anybody else have a final question? We are right at 8.30. I have a question um, really quick. What's, well, how do we get access to your coaching program, Shola? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if so, my I do have a um, so my coaching program is for wedding planners, but I do also um, coach people one on one. Let me just actually I can drop the link um, to it. Um, 
where you can just fill out a quick form, right? And just let me know um, what your goals are and all that. And then I can just uh, let you know what the right next step would be. Um, so I basically offer like half, um, half day and full day VIP days. Um, sorry. And so I'm just gonna get the link and share it. Um, it's not necessarily publicly accessible just yet. Uh, like it's not on my Instagram basically, but um, I'll, I can go ahead and share that. Um, and also if you if you wanted to um, DM me, that's also an option and then I can just send you that. But um, yeah, it's usually, I usually like to start with a discovery call just to make sure that we're on the same page about the goals for your business, um, you know, what you're trying to get out of it. If it's focused on marketing, it's focused on something else um, just so we can map out a plan and then, and then we go from there. Awesome. Thank you again so much. Again, very practical, very helpful, obviously backed by a lot of experience. Thank you, ladies, for joining us for this month's Biz Collective. Small, intimate group, but I love it because it always makes for good discussion. Um, if you would like to stay connected with us, we do have meetups on the third Friday of each month. We have our Facebook group, which is probably our most interactive online platform. People are always exchanging ideas. So connect with McQuinn on the Facebook group. Um, if you're not already, we're on Instagram. We have a Facebook page, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, you can learn more about us for those who are not previously familiar. McQuinn.org is our website. And um, to plug it one more time, our conference, Embracing You Conference, to this year it's a half day um, conference where we're doing workshops. So we're talking marketing, we're talking strategy, we're talking funding, we're talking relationship management, leadership. Um, we're trying to pack as much as we can. And this year you get the option to choose your track, whether you wanna do workshops in the personal development track or the professional development track. And right now tickets are only $25. Um, it is virtual this year, so early bird ends July 5th. If you have not registered, please do register. Um, if you're a member of McQuinn, you know that all fees are waived, so you just have to put in your membership ID um, on Eventbrite to have to access that. But thank you ladies so much. Um, any other questions that you have, feel free to email us or contact us directly on our website. And then thank you again so much, um, Faye Shola, this was excellent. Yes, this is great. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I look forward to hopefully connecting with everyone on the gram, you know, or wherever else you hang out. Um, I'm happy to discuss anything else in the DMs and all of that. And obviously, if anyone's interested in coaching, please, uh, please reach out. It's just a form, you know, just for us to chat more. And, and we can go from there. And I'm really excited about um, all the events and things you have coming up at McQuinn. I think this is an awesome platform. So congrats to y'all for being plugged in with, with McQuinn. Thank you so much. And if you want to um, send the coaching information, facial as an aside, we'll make sure we put that and just promote that for you in the group as well. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. You have a good evening, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you so much.